Hi everyone, welcome to the Finance Story Networking and Career Series, where we bring you the best minds and voices to share their learnings and make us ponder on more possibilities. Today we have with us Mr. Richard Reiki, who is the former CEO of KPMG in India, where he was a member of the Global Board and the Council of KPMG International. Richard has over 39 years plus of experience in consulting and professional services and has worked with Arthur Anderson, EY, KPMG, you know, where he has spearheaded the firm in various capacities. So to give a little background, Richard started his career in 1983 at a mid-sized firm. And over the years, he developed entrepreneurial abilities and later moved to larger firms where he transformed into a leader and eventually becoming the CEO at KPMG India from 2012 until 2017. Today, he's an entrepreneur, board member, non-executive director of several companies, organizations and forums. Richard is a phenomenal leader, a great human and a very inspiring person. So in our conversation today, we will focus how can one, you know, make it big in the big four, big 10 firms, professional services firms in India. And how can you leverage uh, our, your experience at professional firms to succeed in new roles and a lot more. Richard, thank you so much for joining in. I mean, I'm so excited and thank you for the time. No, thank you, Shantal, for inviting me. And I really look forward to this discussion. And uh, all the audience, who, whoever are listening, and I hope you can get something out of it. Maybe I will learn something out of this discussion. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining in. So, Richard, let's dive into our first question. So, all watching, if you have questions, please type in, and we will get every question answered uh, by Richard. So, Richard, my first uh, you know, question is, I know you started your career in 1983. Uh, so could you take us you know, back uh, at, at, at how did you grow in your career and you know, how did you go from partner, senior partner, CEO, what skills, experiences you, know, you believe were most important in achieving this role? And, and you know, one question that I would really like to ask, was it like destiny that you know, out of so many people, you were the one person to become the CEO? So take us through your journey if you could. OK, let me start with the last one. <laughs> Uh, whether it is destiny, I think it was destiny. It was luck, uh, being at the right place at the right time. Uh, so let's put it there. I had never planned to be a CEO of a big four. I never joined a big four or a big five. Actually, my career started in a mid-sized firm. Uh, I was very fortunate, unlike many people who believe they should start their career in a big four. Um, um, I started my career in a mid-sized firm and I learned a lot out there. I was very lucky to get my mentor very early in my life. Um, uh, and that was Mr. Mama, who was the founder of that firm. I learned a lot from him, actually. Uh, he, he um, I mean, you learn by, uh, you know, observing somebody, what they do. And uh, uh, I think uh, I learned to be an entrepreneur in Rathanis Mama and Company. I learned what it meant to be an entrepreneur, what it meant to make sacrifices, what it meant not to be earning any money and what it meant to be uh, suddenly succeeding. And, uh, you know, tasting the success, uh, selling a non-brand, in a because when I went and opened the Delhi office, we literally had no clients. And you had to start from scratch, you had to actually sell the firm, and it was not a known brand. So it was very, very difficult. And, uh, but by God's grace, things worked out. And then I joined Arthur Anderson. Uh, I had my struggle in Anderson for the first year. And uh, I almost gave it up. And uh, but something in me said, no, I will stand back and fight and work harder. And I did that. And uh, rest is history. Uh, I learned so much in Arthur Anderson. I owe a lot to that firm uh, also for my other part of my growth of the ability to think big, the ability to uh, think of high quality work and the ability to be very proud of yourself and very proud of your achievements and uh, work even harder than what you would normally work and uh, uh, give the best to the client and to become premium. The one thing that I learned what it means to be premium and when you're premium, you also charge premium fees, you earn good salary, you work in the best of offices, you work with the best of clients, but you deliver something which the client is not expected. You delight the client and that's what we that's what i learned and then i moved uh, we merged after the anderson collapse we were a little while in ernst and young i learned a lot there what to sell how to sell they were a very very strong sales um, uh, organization and a lot of good friends i made there very short period 20 months i was there 
and then I joined KPMG. I had various roles across KPMG. I found KPMG to be a firm which was very much aligned to my values, my personal values. And so it was like fitting in, you know, a glove fitting your hand perfectly. And uh, I still, uh, though I've left KPMG, for me, there is no other firm I can think of other than KPMG. I've not, I've got many offers to go and work with many other organizations, many other consulting firms, but I've not taken it uh, because I still believe that the KPMG is in me. So, uh, and uh, so here I got a great opportunities of having different roles. Uh, very quickly into the firm, I became the chief operating officer uh, where I, it was a joint leadership with the CEO. And then I became the head of advisory where I handled the, the whole advisory business, which was the largest practice we had at that point of time. And then this opportunity came to stand for the CEO. That was the first time we did an election. The partners actually voted and by God's grace, I was voted in. And, uh, uh, and that, so I never ever, uh, uh, honestly, before they never aspired to be a CEO. And, um, and this came to me, I worked very hard. I tried my level best to give the best to the firm and, uh, you know, make the firm. Uh, my one dream and vision was when I became CEO was, can I make this firm a happier place? Because what I find is that most people who work in these large organizations are not happy individuals. They may earn a lot of money, they may go around, but they're not happy. And I was saying, can I breed some happiness? So uh, the one of the big changes or one of the big areas that I focused on was on people on bringing in people policies, making it a better place. I'm not sure how much I succeeded, but uh, our launch of a higher purpose, our launch of our town halls, even today after five years of leaving the India firm, uh, when I meet people at airports, they said they can never forget those town halls. They can never forget the higher purpose. So I think somewhere we did something right. And this stuck in people because higher purpose actually takes you very simply defined for people who don't know what higher purpose is. We have been practicing it right through my life, actually. I called it something different, but now um, it got a terminology of higher purpose. It is something you do beyond your work. Your salary is your current account. Your higher purpose is your capital account. That is where you give something back to society, give something go beyond just the money that you earn. And uh, so... Um, I think uh, uh, for me, all in all, it has been a great journey. If somebody asks me, would you want to change something from what you have? I will say no, exactly the same. Because if you want to take the good, you got to take the bad. I had many failures, many failures. In fact, my entire growth story has been built on my failures because I learned a lot in my failures. I learned to work harder. I learned to bounce back and I came out stronger each time. And I came out better in my own eyes. You know, first you have to actually rise in your own self-esteem and then you can rise in others' eyes. So in brief, I, I hope I covered the entire whatever my career out here. Yes. Absolutely, Richard. And, you know, I love the point where you mentioned you always looked at people's happiness because this is a mental health week. You know, and every everyone's going through something or the other. So that's that's amazing to ponder that you, you have to look after your mind and happiness as well. Uh, so, Richard, you know, I will just, uh, uh, you know, dig in a little deeper. Can you just elaborate a little bit on your failures, if you're OK, and the challenges you face because in your career pathway and how did you navigate through it? So my first failure, I would say, was very early in my career when I was at Ratanis Mama and Company. I was asked to go and set up the Delhi office. I didn't understand what it means to set up an office. No people, no staff, no money, nothing. And uh, my uh, head office, which was Mumbai, Bombay at that time, they said, if you want to survive, you, uh, you earn your money or you lock the office and come back to Bombay. Uh, that was a big challenge to me. So I can, I still remember that for those for nine months after which my funding stopped from the head office, uh, I did not take a single rupee from the firm because I had to run the firm. It was very hard uh, for somebody who's just starting out on his career. There's not much savings, not much money. But one went through all of that. Even like, for example, investing in uh, investing into some of the equipment in the office. 
and I used to go to my clients and ask them, can you give me my fees in advance? So that was a very tough period. I didn't know that I would ever be able to navigate it. But, you know, they say fortune favors the brave. I was very lucky. I met some people. I made friends. I got some big clients, some really big marquee names. Uh, we started working with multinational companies uh, who were paying us the same fee that they were paying the big five at that time, almost. I'm talking of firms like Ernst & Young and all that. And uh, uh, they paid us the fees because what we brought to the table was quality. And they said, we don't differentiate because if you, whatever you may be, you're not a brand, but if you deliver that quality, we're going to pay you that fees. That's the first time it struck me that you deliver quality, you'll be paid the money. And it is not about the brand you carry, or it's about the work you do. And uh, <clears throat> I was fortunate uh, that uh, we went through that. That was my first failure, real failure. Of course, there are many more minor failures in my earlier part of my career where I was lambasted and, you know, I did things which I should not have done. But uh, uh, but my second big failure was not making to partner in Arthur Anderson, though I was a partner in Ratan Mama. I didn't make it to partner at that time. And uh, I was really angry. And uh, and uh, but uh, then I introspected after 15 days, cooled down, put my head down and I said I must work harder. There were, let me tell you, there were counter offers. I won't say from whom, but from the other big four, other big five. And they were like giving me comps three times of what I was getting at Anderson. But I decided, no, I will stay back here and fight. I will become a partner in Anderson. Even if I have to leave the next day, but I'll become a partner in Arthur Anderson. And I don't want to go out as a failure. And uh, so I worked hard and I did make it to partner. And just to share with you one thing and share with everybody else out here, they say that water finds its own level and all the hard work that you put in may not get rewarded at the time when you put it in, but you do get rewarded. And I was very happy when at Anderson, they took me up three to four notches up over the level at which I was. And uh, so that was a kind of a thing of saying, OK, thank you. I mean, like it was a thing to me that, OK, I got my credit for whatever I debits I got. But that was a big failure in my mind. Uh, my third failure was when we lost a big client of ours, uh, where we had invested a lot of money. It was our biggest client in India. And the client suddenly decided to, to, to not have us have KPMG. This was at KPMG, actually, not have us, with no fault of ours, honestly. And my team was absolutely very upset with this. And they said, please invoke the contract. I went to meet the client with the mind that we're going to invoke the, oh, I'm sorry, the lights, uh, the invoke the contract. And, uh, um, <clears throat> the, but uh, when I was sitting across the client, I don't know what snapped in my mind. I'm a gut player. Let me tell you, I'm a gut. I play by my gut. And uh, some of my major decisions have taken five minutes, major. <laughs> so, uh, and I've noticed whenever I go with my gut, I never go wrong. But whenever I've challenged my gut, I've gone wrong. I failed in those times. So I was sitting in front of this client and I told him, we are not going to invoke the contract. What he told me at that stage was that he got a client for life. And I walked out from there saying that if ever you want to appoint another professional firm for any work you're doing, it is a large US company actually. And uh, please use us, give us an opportunity. And let me tell you, till I was in KPMG for the 10 years after that, uh, every year we were earning more money than what we earned earlier. So that one decision at that point of time, which was a big failure, uh, according for all of us, because we had done it, uh, turned out to be a blessing. But it was just that you know, one was fortunate to take the decision one took. So I'm just saying, let's not be short term in our decisions. We could have earned one year's compensation for not doing any work. Instead of that, we earned for 10 years, maybe the firm worked even longer than that, but 10 years, the firm continued to earn millions of dollars from that same client. Wow. That's, these, that's, were, these are a few instances. Of what, And there are many small failures, but these would be the three, you know, three, four ones, which uh, I clearly remember. That's it's amazing. 
Yeah. So Richard, you know, I'll just ask you a little more, you know, especially about your, when you didn't become a partner at Arthur Anderson and, you know, those 15 days you went through a lot and I'm sure uh, you were also angry with, you know, your seniors, like why me? Yeah. I, I'm a good performer. So how did you deal with them later on? You know, because it's not easy, you know, when you know you've not been given something which you really deserve because a lot of people are going through something similar. This promotions have just happened. A lot of people have not got their high. So how, did you deal with it? Like, how did you help? How did your mind uh, work then? So fortunately for me, Chantal, uh, it is very simple. Um, I move on from my positions pretty quickly. Uh, I am not stuck on anything. Uh, and I know many people do get stuck. And I would just give advice to everybody. Please do not get stuck into anything. Because nothing is permanent. Nothing is yours. And uh, maybe I thought I was ready to be a partner. And maybe I was not. And that's how I introspected to myself. And I said, I must work so hard now in this year that these guys recognize me and they call me and they make me a partner. And, uh, uh, and that's exactly what happened. And, uh, uh, but what gave me, uh, 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 while I did not make it to partner in the, in the division which I was, there was another division head who came to me. He said, you move to my division, I'll make you a partner immediately. It was in the tax and I didn't understand tax. So he says, no, no, you don't need to understand tax. Your BD skills are good enough. You will get us the business. You come and be a partner. The one thing which I learned in Ratan Mama was how to sell. And I think that was my biggest uh, uh, USP. I learned how to build relationships. Relationships. Now, please understand for all people listening in, relationship is not transactional. It's not when you want something, you go to somebody. But even when you have no work, you're there with them, you're guiding them through their tough times, you're not charging them fees at that time, they will never forget you. When the time for payback time comes, they pay you back much more than what you had invested in them. This I learned from my personal experiences with, with many clients I worked with. And uh, <clears throat> the clients always stood well. For me, I always wanted to be the best client service uh, partner. And uh, where uh, you earned the most, uh, you client trusted you, never discussed fees, and always paid. Uh, I remember once, I remember I had done an assignment and I walked into office. The client calls me and tells me, what's your bill number? I said, bill number of what? So I said, I just finished it. I don't have a bill. And he said, I want to pay you. I was, I'm very happy with the work you've done. So a client coming and telling you that they want to pay you, is an affirmation that they're very happy with the quality of work. So always concentrated on the quality of work. And all these learnings, mind you, have come from my firm, my first firm, which got obviously reiterated in Arthur Anderson because they also believed in quality and very high quality. And uh, that has stayed with me for a long time. Wow. So dealing, like you said, how do you deal with your people? I learned how to deal. See, I never take a grudge against anybody. There could be circumstances why people do something. So I just <clears throat> looked at it and said, okay, they took a decision. It's fine. Uh, let me show who I am. And uh, over a period of time, let me tell you my boss who did not, uh, when I didn't become, became my best friend at the end of it. And uh, uh, he trusted me a lot in everything. So uh, I, I would like to thank him for everything that uh, he supported me through. Wow. that That's some great learning, not holding a grudge because that's, that opens yeah. up a lot of us. It's a great learning for me as well. So I'm taking this. Okay. So Richard, I'll just go in a little deeper into how did you develop your sales skills, networking skills, because uh, you're a chartered accountant. A lot of people uh, on the finance story are CAs. Okay. And we're not taught how to sell, right? We're all, but, but if see, as you said, becoming a partner is all about selling. That's one. Okay. And how do you, you know, when you say sales, you think, think of someone, you know, all out who's like, you know, strong and, you know, you know how you watch on TV, but, so can you just tell me what is sales and how do you develop that skill set? So, really, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and relationships. Like you mentioned yeah. that you have to build genuine, but how do you, you know, work on it? So, so I'll give you one very simple example. Um, whenever you are into any, and this, uh, I don't know from where it came, maybe it's inbuilt in me. Uh, right from my younger days, right when I started my career at Ratanas Mama and Company, we used to go to various audits and various clients in, in various cities, in factories, you know, in locations which you would not normally travel to, where to take a train or a bus or whatever. 
And at that time, we were not earning much money. So we used to manage with whatever we got. And uh, uh, but, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just I'm sorry if I'm sharing something very personal out here. But uh, one day I was sitting at the at uh, one of our clients offices, the Taj Group, and they had all the offices in the basement. And one of the CFOs or one of the group companies came to me and there's a lady sitting in my room who's our auditor and she wants to meet you. So, uh, so I said, okay, at the end of the evening, I will come to your office and meet her. So when I came to meet her, she said, you know, I also worked in Ratanes Mama and Company, Bombay office. And uh, uh, she said, the one thing that struck me was that while uh, everybody, uh, you know, uh, it's been ages since you have been left Bombay. It's been eight years since you left Bombay. And uh, every time we, I went to a client where you had gone and most of the clients which you had gone to, I was going there, she was going there and they only asked about you. So my point to everybody out here is when you get an in opportunity to interact, leave an impact on the client and you can only leave an impact if you're genuine, you're honest and you're able to do some work which they remember you for. It is not about just just being goody goody with people. It's about uh, you know how you leave an impact and uh, uh, do they remember you for either the good work you have done, the hard work you have done, or whatever may be the uh, things which they see in you. So I think the the point is um, we need to. Um, uh, so that is hard work. Now, as far as sales is concerned, we think that various. Uh, people need to be this completely outgoing, boisterous, loud, uh, macho, or very strong lady who goes there and you know is able to uh, sell there. But I think sales, the biggest quality I think in sales is humility. And you never sell. Oh, I'm sorry when you ask me, you never sell. You never sell in the face. The client knows why you are there. You need to show your knowledge and your credentials. You need to show what you can actually do and talk about, you know. So you, for that, you need, I was a voracious reader when I was young. Let me tell you, I used to read a lot. And I used to read a lot of management books. I used to read a lot of uh, books of how to become a great leader, how to think positively. I read various books across. Uh, I used to read, I mean, it was like a big thing for me. All that I read when I was early growing up, sometimes I was reading uh, also fiction and everything else. So I used to read a lot. So uh, I don't read now, by the way. So I watch more of YouTube and TED Talks and everything else. But um, uh, but I think that, that helped me a lot in my client conversations. And, uh, um, and you're very genuine. You see, when the client is in trouble, how do you deal with the individual then? Because a client comes to you, when he comes to you, he's quite nervous. He doesn't, he doesn't know how to solve the problem, how much you solve. And uh, I found this, uh, I found that I had this quality where I could connect with the client and the client trusted me very easily. I don't know what it is. Uh, if you ask me, what was it? How can a client after the first meeting come and start trusting you? I remember this lady CFO, uh, one day she came to me and uh, I, went, I met her for the first time and uh, saying, can I take you out for lunch? And we went out for lunch and said, I do not know why, but I can trust you. And I want to tell you my problem. I've hidden this from the auditors for so long. And she came out with her problem and we worked on it. So there were many such instances I had in my life where clients came out. And so either you show that you are empathetic, you've got empathy, you're able to understand their position and you're able to solve their position and you're ready to help them through that journey. And for that, you need to be pragmatic, you need to be practical, you need to think out of the box, you need to come up with innovative solutions and help the clients. Wow. So I think sales is not going there. See, it's like this, if, some, if today somebody wants, I give it an example in a very different way, Chantal. I say that I need money, so I come to you and say, Chantal, can you give me a thousand rupees or thousand dollars? And uh, you give it to me first time. Next time, I again say $1,000. The third time, you won't even take my phone. So if you go to a client all the time and say, give me work, give me work, he's not going to give you work. So you need to go there and uh, work with him, understand his problems, and create the work for yourself. And sometimes when you're walking through that journey, he starts trusting you. I'll give one small example. A very large media company, international, one of the best-known brands in the world, 
uh, they, the CFO, she called me up and she said, uh, I want a strategy done. Who would you suggest should be doing this strategy work? Uh, that time I was in KPMG. And so I said, uh, uh, I think McKinsey would be good or, you know, some other firm would be good. But by the way, we also do some strategy work. So in case you want, I can send you my credentials. And um, uh, she and she told, I told her, she, they finally appointed us. And she said, your honesty is what won you the job. In certain cases, when I spoke to the client and asked, why did you give the work? He's saying, the hunger which you guys showed made us decide on you. And sometimes it came out that the team you brought was so outstanding, we gave you the work. So there are various reasons in which you win the work and never sell in the face. For all people who are out there in the market, please do not go and sell in the face. It can be very irritating to a client. They know why you are there. You are there to win the job. Uh, just uh, let the, go with the flow. See how the client reacts. Wow, that's that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting and a, and a and a great share, you know. And so so also you don't it what I also what also really appealed to me is that you don't have to be that outgoing, you know, that extroverted person. You can also be yourself and just provide genuine services. Be genuine yes. because the person on the other side understands, you know. Yeah. And be honest. So if something you're not good at, just tell them we can't do this work. Uh, I think the honesty will pay you a long way. So many times the client will say, okay, I know you can't do it, but can you try it? He may still give you the work. He's saying, try it. We will work together. We'll try to find the solution. Because many times the problem is so complex. It's very difficult for some one firm or one individual to solve it. So it requires much more than that. And uh, I think, and we are living in today's time. We are living in an era of collaborations coming together. So the more we collaborate, the more we talk for everybody else, it's better. Even with our competitors, collaborating with our competitors is not bad at all. Because uh, both are, uh, the market is limited. We all need to win. But you must have a winning spirit. Actually, Shantal, the point is how hungry and how you much, how much do you desire to win? If you have the strong desire to win, you will turn uh, things over. You will come and give the client so much of information. You'll give them this. And they'll say, these are the guys we want. There was this one client, you know, we were pitching to this one, Arthur Anderson, by the way. They'd already decided on another big four, big five at that time. We were five firms at that when Anderson was alive. Uh, they'd already decided and the owner of the company, a large pharmaceutical company, uh, I was presenting, my boss was there. And he said, you know, I must, you must compliment yourself that you got me interested in your firm. I said, what do you mean? Uh, he's saying, no, I already decided who I need to give the work to. Uh, but you have come, you made me rethink it. So I asked him, uh, what would make you change your mind? And uh, 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 then he gave us that work. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then I, after he gave us the work, I asked him why. He said, the hunger which you showed, no other firm showed it. And uh, uh, he said, uh, the way you kept going at us, though we had already taken a decision on the other firm, you kept going knowing that you may never get it. But even with a loss situation, you continued with that same drive, same hunger. So imagine appointing you as my consultant or auditor, what benefit I'll get out of it. And let me tell you, right till after even Anderson died, you know, when we were in the collapse stage, he said, you decide which firm you are going to merge into. We will move the work to that firm. We'll wait for your decision. I mean, that was the kind of relationship one built with these people. Wow, that's truly inspiring. So yeah. even when you're down and out, you should have the winning desire. You should have, you should motivate yourself. There are days where things, you know, where you will always not be motivated, but you have to keep going. That's, that's the mantra. And also, uh, let me tell you, we all go through midlife crisis. So all people who are going through the midlife crisis, whoever is listening in, there's a story of the eagle, please read it. How the eagle goes and rejuvenates itself and then flies for the next 30 years. That's what you can do. And that's what the story was sent to us when we were at Anderson and we had collapsed and we were down and out. Somebody sent this to you, the eagle, and it stuck with me so much that how you can revive yourself, pick yourself up, get ready for the next challenge and then fly for the next 30 years. And I just want to leave it with everybody. Read the story of the Eagle. It's a fantastic story. That's amazing. So we've got Vinod saying great insights. We've got Madhurika Sharma 
saying great insights. They're all so inspired. Preeti, Nikhil. So, you know, we'll take up their questions, but we, we'll continue the conversation. Yeah. So, okay, so Richard, uh, you know, I have this very basic question for you, okay? Uh, what is a hierarchy structure, you know, at a big four, a big 10 firm? And, and what does a partner typically do? Also today, you know, considering the size of partnership has grown, you know, much larger, right? So how can, you know, you be looked upon as the most valued partner within the group? I mean, I know you've answered a lot of things, but if you could just... No, no, I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, there are some few things I need to talk about. Uh, but I think the most important thing uh, when we talk of uh, hierarchy, let's go to the hierarchy one first. In the hierarchy, the highest you can go in a, in a firm is a partner. Okay, is the highest you can go. Now, you get titles once you become head of this, national head of this, CEO, chairman, all that, board member. Now, these ultimately the base is being a partner. What the big four have not cracked or the big 10, like you said, the large firms have not cracked is when an employee joins, we have a career path for them. Nobody has cracked it. What is the career path for a partner? Because people make it to partner when you're about 35, uh, 35, 38 or between 30. If you're a fast tracker, maybe 32 or whatever. But uh, generally, you make it at 34, 35, and you've got 25 years more of your career till you retire at 60. What is the career path? So till 35, we have a career path. What is your career path after 35? That is something that, that has to get worked on. There is no structured way of which it goes. So if you ask me, is there a structure to it? Yes, people grow, people um, uh, excel. They do uh, have some great client relationships. They bring in new business. They bring more insights. They're more proactive. They're very good. See, the, the biggest skill that anybody can have while you're growing up, and I will just leave it with everybody, is you must have your biggest and most valuable asset is your network. Does your net work? And I'm saying, does your net work? I mean, it's just not having a network, but does that net actually work for you? You know, if you have Wi-Fi, it doesn't work. It's useless, right? I mean, it's like oxygen. So I think a network is an oxygen for a professional. And don't get excited that when you're young, you build relations with the level of your people. Please understand as you grow, they will also grow. So when you are young and you're a senior and you're assistant manager, your manager, all the people may be at lower level in the client organization, but they will also grow to become CFOs, CEOs. And if you cultivate that relationship, the one thing which I'll tell you, uh, which I want to share with people, which I learned from Mr. Mama was, <clears throat> don't just build the relationship at the top. And let me tell you, wherever I did that, I also suffered for it. Because when that top man went, the job went. So we must build relationships across the hierarchy and the organization. So the highest a person can get to in a, in a firm is partner, then you have director, then you have senior manager, and then you have, you can call them associate directors, and then you have managers. And then within the thing you have, like I said, uh, you, have, uh, you have CEOs, you have uh, all that which you can become, but only one individual can become a CEO. I don't think we should get too enamored with a CEO. Uh, I think it's more an administrative job. Uh, I think it is, uh, it is about clients ultimately. At the end of it, it's about your client relationships. Uh, that Can you convert that? And uh, um, uh, I think uh, to stand out a partner uh, for you said, what is uh, uh, a partner standout uh, thing would be, uh, does he bring in, does he or she bring in big wins? Uh, do they, um, uh, are they, uh, uh, do they have good people? See, the one is network and the second is people skills. How strong are your people skills? Because ultimately, it's about people. You have to motivate your teams. Uh, I always say one thing. Uh, this is my uh, personal thing. That a good leader is who builds other leaders. So when you become a leader, how many, ask yourself that one question. How many leaders have you built? What is the respect you have in the society in which you live? I mean, in the building in which you live. Do people respect you? Do people want to join your organization because they see you? They said, oh, this is a great, this guy is working, this organization or this individual is working here. I want my brother or my sister or my children to work in the same organization because this individual is on a great, I mean, they get inspired by you. 
So leaders inspire. So I think we have to transition as we are growing up from being a manager to being a leader. A leader motivates and inspires. A manager gets a task done. And we have to move from this position to being a leader where you inspire people. And through your own work, I can stand on the stage and, you know, sermonize on every single value and everything else. And I live a very different life. You have to live, you have to actually live your live the life which you are there. So I think you need to possess great empathy. You need to be agile. You need to be innovative. You need to have great critical thinking skills um, if you want to stand out. And you need, you don't need to go blowing your trumpet. It's just that your work speaks for itself. The clients speak for you. The, the kind of assignments you do, the kind of follow-up work you get, the kind of uh, recognition you get, uh, because there are two things. One is the firm's brand. So when I work in KPMG, I have the KPMG brand. But what is my personal brand as an individual? Do people recognize me? Do they know me by my name? Would they call me out and say, I want this assignment to be done by this individual? And you know, what heartens me from time to time is where people have remembered some of the engagements you have done and delivered for them, which I have forgotten, honestly after living through so many, uh, uh, you know, uh, years. Uh, but they remember the kind of work you've done and how you did it. So I think when we have got a task, the problem with most of us is we are looking for promotions, we are looking for everything else, and we don't work on the task at hand. So I think it is about how much hard work we put in. It's all about hard work and consistency. Hard work, consistency, discipline, very important. You've got to be disciplined and uh, uh, I'm not bragging here, but I used to be almost the first guy into the office when I was the CEO. Even before that, I used to be uh, come in there and do my work, uh, work as hard as you can. Now, maybe I have a different view to life because there needs to be a work-life balance. Uh, uh, I call it work-life harmony. I don't call it work-life balance. So we need to be smart about it. How do we balance between our work and uh, other part of our life? But if we want to make it big, we really got to work hard. You got to make sacrifices. And if you feel that uh, there could be some people who are lucky and um, uh, they, they make it, but I think it's all about hard work, consistency. Secondly, do you make an impact? See, the one thing I want to tell you is that we are say, okay, you know, some people come and ask, why am I not making to partner? The one question which I will say, do you make an impact? Do you have a boardroom presence? You walk into a boardroom, do people notice you have come in? Do you make an impact when you meet people? And those meetings can be anywhere, Shantal. It could be in an elevator. I mean, we heard this great elevator pitch. Uh, it could be anywhere. You don't know who you're going to meet and you get that one minute with that individual. Are you able to leave some impression on him? And I'll just tell you, um, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm talking all about myself, but, uh, you know, yesterday I was on a call as on a, a board of some uh, company in UK and uh, one of the guys who's in US, he, uh, you know, just before the call start, board meeting started, he said, you know, this individual, did you ever, did you ever meet him? So I said, yeah, I remember I met him in Davos. Uh, he was a global chairman of a large private equity, one of the largest private equities in the world. And he was a global chairman. Now, this meeting happened 10 years back. Okay. And he said he was talking very highly about you. Now, that was a 15 minutes meeting with him in Davos because his India CEO and I agreed to meet. And he, this fellow brought his boss along. And uh, he just liked maybe what I told him or what I said to him. So you need at that moment to be prepared to speak the relevant talk that individual may want to hear. Because he wanted to understand the India market. He wanted to understand why are the private equities not making money in India? What is the reason? You know, and you need to be prepared. So all the time you need to heard. Nobody will meet you if you don't add value. So every time if I come to meet you and if I don't add any value to you, that will be the last coffee you will have with me. No CEO will call you. He doesn't have time or she doesn't have time to waste on you. So you need to be well prepared for the meetings. So before I used to go for any meeting, I used to get well briefed if it was a new client, well briefed on what work we do, what are the challenges, what possible questions the chairman will ask or the CEO will ask. So that at the end of it, he feels happy and he'll call you again. Then he calls you. 
because he will want uh, that meeting. Uh, and I can give you one small example. Uh, uh, I once invited Mr. Biki Oberoi, the chairman of the Oberoi group, uh, for coming and speaking at our partners meeting. And his secretary with great difficulty gave us half an hour. So I went in and told you better be on time because he doesn't have time for that meeting lasted four hours. Wow. Uh, with him, he wanted to know all about my life story, where I was born, uh, what I did, and um, um, uh, over that period of time, uh, he started looking forward for me to come and meet with him. And we were never discussing any work. We discussed about the hotel industry. We discussed about many things. And in the course of the conversation, I realized he liked Uday Vilas, one of his properties. So when we made a proposal to him for some work, I put Uday Vilas, his first comment, my God, Uday Vilas on the cover, beautiful. He's saying, this is, the, this is the proposal I was looking for. So, you know, you should know how to, uh, uh, you know, interact with uh, somebody who likes something, you'll be able to. So in the course of conversation, you should be able to find out what are the things that impress people. And uh, and um, I didn't know Vicky Oberoi before. I'd heard about this great doyen of the hotel industry. But over that period of time, we built a relationship, whatever the period. And we both liked our conversations. And it could be very different things. So that's what I'm saying. Many times, it's not about work. Work with, They know why you're there. You're not there to have that conversation. You're building a relationship. And relationship building has nothing to do with work. It's about trying to help the individual through their challenges, whatever it is. So I would leave this. Uh, so I think agility is also very important. And I think uh, energy, hunger, which I spoke about earlier, should be very much there. You must. You have to be very highly. And one thing I will just say, leave. Always be good health. Always be in good health, whether it's physical and mental. And you must be fit because the job is very strenuous. It's very stressful. And we all need to find our own stress busters. For me, my stress buster was my music. I remember early when Anderson days, when it were tough days, you know, going home at 10, 11, sometimes at one o'clock in the morning, uh, I used to drive, I used to send my driver away. I used to drive the car from Nariman Point to Bandra, where I used to live. And I used to put on my music. That music was so soothing, uh, driving along, listening to my songs. And uh, I would be feeling refreshed by the time I reached home, even after a hard day's work. So, and I never took work home. I decided my workplace and my home are two different things. Of course, now it's all work from home and everything else has changed. But I kept that thing. So, okay, home is for home and work is, you know, so I would spend long hours in office or whatever, but I would finish my work and not take anything home. That's some great advice. You know, Richard, I, I'll just, um, this, this is amazing. Okay, but I'll, I have to ask you this point on networking, you know, because everyone yeah. watching also would want this because today we are in a world where we're told, hey, you have to network. We all know our network is our net worth. It's told, repeated, it's spoken repeatedly. But uh, like, for example, you get constant messages on LinkedIn, Instagram, hey, can you meet for coffee? And, you know, of course, yeah. They are, so, so how do you decide who do you meet, who do you not meet? And how do you maintain those relationships, especially like, there's Diwali and you'll get 100 messages. So how do you do that in today's world where you have so much of access to people and you can engage with everyone, you know? If you so, uh, so I think uh, we should, the problem with most of us is uh, when we see a senior person, a CEO, chairman or some or CFO or whatever level, you know, some C-suite person, oh, we would love to respond to him, send him great messages, all that. For me, uh, title didn't make a difference because I know title is temporary. It's going to go away one day. It's not going to remain. So um, even in KPMG, it was not always the partner who got all my time. It could be a youngster, a complete junior who would want time with me. Uh, he would get it. Manisha would know that, you know, I'm not uh, this thing to meeting anybody and whoever wants to meet. And I, I was never in my room. So I used to walk the corridors. I used to go to people. And uh, uh, I think the, the, the point is uh, very difficult many times to maintain your network. So for me, uh, my email was handled by Manisha. Uh, my WhatsApp, I used to handle myself. Uh, LinkedIn, I'm very poor. I apologize to anybody who's been writing to me on LinkedIn. I'm very poor on responding to those messages. Let me be very honest. But when I will respond, I will give them a complete answer. 
I will go out of the way to make sure that they, and I don't care who I meet. Today I meet youngsters who want some uh, career guidance. I just go and meet them and I spend maybe hours with them, talking to them, giving them my personal experiences. I go and speak at cities where nobody else wants to speak. I go to tire two, tire three cities, speaking to youngsters, trying to motivate them because they won't get speakers of any caliber going to those places. So today my life has been of going there. Now, how do you maintain your network? I, I, this is not my personal example. Another person who does it very well is every birthday he sends, he's got a whole list of birthday wishes. So uh, he'll send a birthday wish to all the, it's all standardized. It's the template is there and he sends it out. But that keeps the connect, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but for me, I'm a very spontaneous guy. I'm not a structured person. So, uh, but when I meet somebody, it'll be with warmth. It will be with complete I'm with that individual, whoever it is, however senior or junior it may be. I'll just give you one message I read on LinkedIn and I wrote an article on authentic leadership. Uh, this person said that, uh, I don't remember this incident, honestly, and I'll just be honest about it. Uh, he said that uh, I was a very junior person in KPMG and he was talking to me. He realized this conversation is going to go on. He called up his secretary and said, change my flight. Um, uh, change it to a later time because I want to finish this call. So the point is that you have to give your all into something. And it is not, uh, you know, like many people, Shantil will come to you and say, how are you? And before you can answer, they have passed you by. So sit, listen to them. If they have a problem, when you meet them second time, register it in your mind. Next time you ask them, so how's your brother? How's your sister? How's your mother? Is she better now? And very small things because when you are in cry when people are in a crisis situation and you're with them i think they never forget it and this is one thing i will leave with somebody's going through a tough time with his relative with themselves in a health problem or any other issue for me all my weekends were for people so my Saturdays, sometimes my Sundays uh, were meeting people, understanding their personal problems, their official problems or whatever. And that helped me build a lot of relationships. Because in a larger organization, it's very difficult to meet everybody. So our office used to start at 9 o'clock or 9.30. I used to come about 7.30 to office in the morning. So Manisha, when she couldn't get appointment, she told them, you come at 7.30, if he's free, he'll meet you. So all my free time, which I used to use for planning my day, went away because then people were waiting outside my room to come and talk to me. So I think the but you should never, in, you should never discriminate. I would say, people never forget when they are when they are junior and you meet them and when they become senior, they will it's payback time. Life is about payback, and I always say hard work has never gone unrewarded. I may not have got it the time when I worked hard. But later on, life rewarded you. And sometimes nobody says I got overpaid. I've really, I've, I've never heard anybody say that I got overpaid. I got a better bonus than what I expected. Uh, but this has happened many times. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's all about that equality which happens. So I think we need to, uh, uh, we need to work uh, hard all the time and not look for the rewards. We should not link it actually. That's some great lessons. Aditya says great insights. So does Nikhil. Uh, so, so you know, uh, Richard, I'll go on to my next question, which a lot of people might want to know. Uh, we know a lot of CAs making it to partner and, you know, the senior level at Big Force. Yeah. What about semi-qualified chartered accountants? There are, there are more semi-qualified CAs, great capabilities. So, or cost accountants, CS professionals. What's, what's your thought pattern on that? So uh, the way I would look at it, uh, you know, I uh, it is really very sad that uh, uh, the way I see it, uh, the person who has become a semi-qualified is not cleared for various reasons, right? Uh, the first advice I'll give people is try to clear your exams. Uh, work hard to clear. Work is not important. You know, your exam is important because there's a huge difference. I'm sorry, I'm not answering your question directly, but I just want to put this across. Uh, uh, you need to become a qualified person because the salary difference is so high between a semi-qualified and a qualified and then your career path also takes a very different path. I think uh, the way I look at life, 
is about the experience you gain during your article period or during the period when you're becoming a chartered accountant. And there are numerable people who are semi-qualified. I think at some stage, if you're not passing your exam, try and do another qualification. Do another qualification which uh, will give you that degree. Unfortunately, we live in a world which talks about degrees, right? But I can tell you there are few people and there could be many more which I don't know about who are semi-qualified and they are successful partners. So it is many times your work. So I think, you know, what we need to do, we need to work very hard. I know one person who I found to be a tremendous individual, let me tell you. But somehow he was not clearing his CA. This was at Arthur Anderson. But he was an outstanding professional. And I and a lot of people loved him. I also uh, liked him a lot. The work he did was outstanding, right? But because he could not clear, he could not. In Anderson, we had a rule that if he did not become a chartered accountant, he could never make it to manager. So he never made it to manager. Okay? And he continued giving his exam. I don't know how many attempts. I, I, let's, let me not embarrass. I don't want to name the guy, but he gave many, many attempts. But he finally cleared. And today, that same individual is in London in a very senior partner at Deloitte's. Doing extremely well. Even when he became a first-year partner, I remember he, I was in London. He, he asked me, uh, you know, my board wants to meet you. They want to take a reference check on me. And uh, the Deloitte's board, they met me. They spoke about him. And uh, uh, and uh, this guy, even from a first year partner, was higher paid than many people. So I think we should not get disillusioned by our qualifications. I think it's about the work and the quality of work we do. I, I know it may be very, uh, many people may not understand what I'm saying, but uh, I've got so many people who really work so hard and the clients love them, the quality of work they do, but they're not qualified. They've not passed their CA. And they have gone and become. So I would say get an alternate qualification which will get you that degree, whether it's a certified internal auditor or um, uh, uh, forensic or, you know, some degree which CFA or whatever, which you may be able to pass. Because sometimes I get the work pressure. Once you start working, Chantal, it's very difficult to pass that exam. It's very difficult because nobody gives you leave and because you don't get it's a chicken and egg story, right? So either you be brave enough and says, okay, I'm going to take two years out of my life and I'm going to qualify this exam. I'm going to crack it. I'll do group at group by group and crack it. Okay. Um, let me tell you, I was very weak. I didn't knew more modern maths and I had to pass that maths exam. And the minimum pass mark was 40%. I said, who's going to learn modern maths? I don't even know the basics of it. So I said, okay, two things I will learn in it. And I'll get my, I'll only concentrate on that. So I only concentrated on two parts of it, which got me my 40 marks, but I learned it so well that there was no way I never got the 40 and the rest, okay, you got 60, 70. So you managed to pass. But I think we need to understand our own weaknesses and we should work on it. Because if you're not a chartered accountant, you can't go anywhere in life, honestly. And, uh, but the semi-qualified, I don't want to put a harbinger. There is a way which you can do it. I think it's about doing good work. It's not about just going and taking any job. It's about, you know, many times in life, I can tell you, when I left Ratan S. Mama and joined Arthur Anderson, I took a big salary cut and went there. Position cut, salary cut. But because I was going for a completely new career in a large multinational firm, I decided to take it because I was seeing the future. We should see where we got. When I left Ernst & Young to join KPMG, I came at one third my compensation. One third. So that was the differential what the two firms paid. But I decided we have to change this position. And we're going to work so hard that we will, you know, change, we will completely change it. By God's grace, it happened. But the point is, uh, uh, I think we need to take those calculated risks in life because we keep hearing the story, right? That if you want to grow, many times you have to pull yourself back. When you want to uh, put a bow in an arrow, you move that thing back and then the arrow shoots out. So I think many times in life, we have to take those calculated risks of uh, going down in our career. Even the guys who are semi-qualified, take good jobs. Don't bother about the salary you're getting. Don't say that, oh, I need to earn this salary. Whatever you get, work hard. I'm telling your work will get recognized and you'll get your job. I mean, I know I'm saying it, you'll say, okay, you are qualified, so you're talking. But I can tell you that if you work hard, 
there is no organization which is so foolish which will not reward you but the problem is we will want to go for those organizations which pay more right and uh, because my salary is more i go there and i suffer i think we should go with our role definition what is where is our passion because even this finance role is so large right i mean like you said how did you learn sales um, it's about meeting people i'm an introvert basically hmm. and uh, 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 people may not think so people tell me are you mad you don't look like an introvert but actually i'm an introvert and uh, but when i qualified the first thing i did i did a course which was over spread over two weekends it was a american course which is no more there now which completely changed my think to life it actually taught me who i am and uh, i mean it taught all of us who were sitting there that we are uh, sorry uh, we are, we are uh, who we are and i think uh, i think the one quality which i will leave with all people who are semi qualified don't lose your self respect for yourself don't bother about your qualification have that high degree of self respect and self esteem and say i'm good try to become good at something become a specialist at something where people will hire you for that specialist skill and they'll pay you for it don't get bothered about titles i always say titles are given respect is earned i think you have to earn the respect for the job you do titles will come with time so i don't think we should get so um, and try and do an alternate course maybe you can do a, a mba degree a mba qualification online maybe you can do something which will help the organization position you uh, because unfortunately larger organizations look at qualifications and i think we need that alternate qualification which we could look at chandra so i think after a particular point of stage of time it's no point wasting our time trying to do the ca exam right and i think uh, somewhere you need to call it off because just your luck it's not that anybody that anybody who passed it is more intelligent than you because what you have learned even i have learned we did the three years of articles we both learned something right um i would only say that uh, uh for people um, who like me who are not the most studious of people you should have a good grasping power you should have an ability to take in what's in the environment you should be very curious you should need to be very uh, understanding what's happening and then connect the dots to find the the one other advice i will leave with people sorry i'm going a little is that the most uncommon thing is common sense and you know it's about being the one other thing which i learned from my mentor was how to be positive how to give solutions so i remember the first time i went to him said these are all the problems we took the paper and threw it in the dustbin he saying anybody can do this you know why will come people appoint you ever in their life he saying go back bring a solution and if you cannot bring a solution then you're not worth uh, the thing so he trained us to give be solution oriented to be positive thinking because this is what clients pay you for they pay you for the solutions you bring to them which others cannot give you can they and i think uh, even for the semi qualified become a specialist in something today there's so many areas to be specialist i'll give ideas to everybody esg is a big new area go there learn esg and become a master in it go and do the courses study it you will be able to definitely benefit out of it that's that's very well answered and that's so true alternate career be confident in yourself don't let yourself down because you keep saying hey i'm a semi qualified semi qualified yeah. and work hard don't chase money it will eventually follow so money always follows let me tell let me share with everybody uh, i have never chased money and i'll tell you whatever you chase you never get uh, i would rather work hard on the job on hand become a specialist at something and today there are so many opportunities we didn't have those opportunities until when we were growing up uh, as a chartered accountant i didn't have either two opportunities i had was what either i go and work um, uh, big four was never i we thought i thought i could never get into big four so uh, but uh, the option was either go and work in corporate become finance department and then become something which my father was forcing me to go thank god i didn't listen to him i continued in my professional career and uh, because he used to tell me you work like a dog you don't get paid you you know whatever and you don't get any money you are just stuck there so uh, uh, i struggled let me tell you financially a lot 
but uh, by God's grace, things worked out. So we need to go through that struggle. We need to go through those sacrifices. We need to go through those days when others are having fun and we will not have that fun. And I think that sacrifice and that this thing, because what people see is your success story. They don't see what you have been through to achieve what you achieved. I'm surprised by this. You know, I would never have guessed that you've gone through this, but uh, that's great that you shared. Yeah, that's amazing. So, Richard, we have a couple of questions, but you know, I have two pointers which I would like to, uh, you know, conclude this conversation you know, about. Uh, the first one is uh, you mentioned today there are great opportunities. One is ESG. We know a lot of uh, people moving from the big four and you know starting their own practices. And and as you said, you started at a mid-sized firm. Okay, so yeah. if you could just uh, sum up about the opportunities that we have today and what can we look at? So uh, today, uh, uh, one of the big things clients look for is quality of service and the person who's going to provide it. When you look at a large organization, the hierarchy provides that uh, solution, right? So it could be the lowest common denominator, the lowest person in the rung who's actually providing but when you're starting your own practice, you are providing that. And that's a big selling point to the clients. The clients love it. If you say that I, Adesh Gupta, is going to be there and supply you the service, the client will give you the work. It's about the quality of work you deliver. Today, the time is gone when they will just give big firms. So the very large companies, because they want to cover themselves, they work with. But there are so many companies today, the entire startup community, uh, the well-funded startups, the, uh, the various mid-sized corporates, the mid to large-sized corporates, they are open to work with anybody. Uh, a great example is Girish Manwari in transaction services. See the way he has established himself and uh, uh, what he has done. And there are many others. Uh, so the, he's one of them. Abhishek Goitka is another one. And so you, you could uh, uh, definitely you know, establish yourself there as an individual entrepreneur or the way I would say, while you start as an individual entrepreneur, you should all get together, collaborate, and build a larger firm. Don't get so, because today, to be able to provide service to the client, client wants a one-stop shop. They want to work with one firm who can give them all the services. So if you collaborate with people, suppose you're in Delhi, collaborate with a firm in Bombay. Join hands. Don't just collaborate. Join hands and become a larger firm. And this is the kind of advice I used to give to you at the institute. And I told them, why don't we get all the local, because we are all local chartered accountants in the big four. There's nobody else. It's Indian chartered accountants who actually are there. So why can't an Indian firm not be built at the same size and large and scale? And they will get the work because if you're able to provide that quality. So I think individuals can do well in today's time. There's enough opportunity for them. Uh, it is going to be hard in the beginning. Let me tell you, getting money is not easy. Getting your fees is not easy. So it's not like a, you know, so when you work somewhere, you get a salary. So every month, some money comes into your account. Here, it's not going to be, it's going to be lumpy. Clients may not even pay sometimes, you know, they they, they default or whatever. So we must be ready for that kind of uh, challenge. Fair enough. So all those, you know, who've taken the plunge and started their own, and I know a lot of them are going through a lot of ups and downs. Like we get messages. Uh, so we should just hold on, keep going. The new India that we collaborate. Get, collaborate. Gentle, collaborate, collaborate. Yeah. Find partners with who you can work with, who you can align, people who've got a similar kind of thinking. See, the first thing I think every chartered accountant should realize is let's do an honest day's job. It's not about making a quick buck, please. Everybody, not about making a quick buck. That quick buck will finish someday, right? So you have to build something, you're building a reputation. It's all about trust ultimately, right? I didn't use this word before, but trust is very important. Clients need to trust you. And once they trust you, and once you trust each other, it's also employees trusting each other. I think you can build. So I think it's about collaborating today and becoming a larger firm between yourselves and being able to do work. Uh, there is enough work available in the market today because there are enough companies coming up. Okay. And India, the future is India. We can see it, right? The whole world is now zeroing down on India. They want everything out here. Uh, you can do a lot of work in the Middle East. I've seen a lot of Indian firms who go and outsource and they get a lot of work. So there are opportunities. You have to take that risk, calculated risk. Today, corporate taxes come into Middle East. How many Indian firms are going to benefit out of it? A lot. That's so true. That's amazing. So, so Richard, can you uh, tell us, uh, you know, your your closing advice 
uh, to those watching and who's going to hear and read this on later on what what would you leave us with one advice so i think uh, the the one advice which i got when i was at arthur anderson was never give up your client uh, uh, always be servicing clients because uh, any admin job is very nice to have you see there are two parts to leadership one i call the front office one i call the back office so people love to have the back office they sit in a table in a room like i'm sitting today or you're sitting and call somebody come and tell me what you have done it's a very lovely kind of job to have but are you there on the field are you there with the clients are you there trying to solve their problems because the clients pay your fees they pay their electricity bills they pay your salaries of your employees the fees they earn and you need to be up there because when the axe will fall or when a downsizing happens i'm talking of larger organizations now the first guys to be chopped will be the admin guys and when i talk of admin means even the admin partners who have got no roles who have got no clients who don't know what to do they'll be out of their job so i think the one advice i will leave everybody is uh, always be with your clients uh, integrity is very important empathy is very important networking is very important you must build your network and you must continue to maintain that network you must find reasons of how you can maintain it you know and you don't need to be uh, like that sending a birthday wish every time i i'm uh, i i have my own views on it uh, but i think it needs to be genuine whatever you do with anybody relationship needs to be genuine it needs to be authentic we have got enough of pretenders and if you're a pretender people can see through it and uh, let me tell you all the people who i may have even asked a simple question when i was at kpmg i remember this girl she had a hand fracture and asked her what happened and then she said can i come and meet you and she came and met me when i left kpmg and i wanted some effort every time she was there to help it you know she would say i will do it for you i will prepare your presentation i will do it so there was these people who actually come out to help you even when you're nobody today i'm nobody there right and i would say that <clears throat> uh, for people who work in larger organizations even respect the lowest people the office boys the people who support you the administration staff who help you look at them and they are human beings they need recognition they need appreciation the one thing i did not say the most powerful thing is appreciation you appreciate somebody because you ask somebody what bonus they got 5 years back they may not remember but you ask them what appreciation they got 15 years back they'll tell you the whole story i can tell you my stories of appreciation i got when i was growing up as a kid you ask me what salary i was getting i don't even remember but i remember this very much wow this is profound and great learning even like for me it's it's something that i will always remember and i've learned a lot from our previous uh, interaction as well when we did a story i sure. really loved a lot richard like you treated me equal i said i want to do an interview you said yes let's go ahead you didn't ask questions what is your readership how many viewers how many people nothing you know and you were just growing then so i'm really yeah. thankful to you for that so yeah thank you. thank you so richard i have this question from mohit okay he says what tips uh, you know we i know we could do a separate conversation entirely on this but since you asked it, what tips you suggest someone with industry experience to move to consulting and big four and he's appreciated the fact that you explained everything so beautifully so yeah so so i would say it, uh, it's a mixed experience from people i know who have moved from industry to big four um, uh, big five at that time some of them have succeeded very well uh, some of see because i'll tell you what happens in industry you got a fixed job a fixed task you don't need to go and sell see the biggest problem that people who come from industry and join consulting firms is business development skills i think they need to uh, 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 pick up what is business development skills and let me for all those who want to join uh, consulting firms forget about big four even the consulting firm the fraternity it's not a bad area to be in but you need to be ready to work hard you need to forget to have dinner with your family at uh, many days you won't have dinner with them uh, you'll travel a lot you'll live in a suitcase Uh, when i was in kpmg ceo one of the journalists in fact published it and said is how he lives on jet airways uh, uh, so in a lighter way i told him he asked me so where do you live i said jet airways because literally on a flight every day so you need to uh, be ready to make those travels make those sacrifices uh, learn business development skills 
the one thing that you learn and it is not it's not easy very easy to say okay bd karo but it is uh, it requires a lot of humility because you need to be ready to get insulted you need to be ready to be rejected you need to be and not feel bad about it still smile with the client shake his hands go away or shake her hands go away maybe some day they will feel soft to you and feel sorry and give you work so maybe uh, uh, you know uh, i think being genuine in a relation so i would say that uh, there can be a big career but we could do a complete session and i could go through the various yeah. because it's, it's a big long thing actually yeah. where it could i could give steps what people need to learn i have personally mentored some people from industry into consulting and they have done very well some have been failures let's not everything doesn't succeed but <clears throat> you can actually be a very successful professional because what you bring from industry is domain expertise you bring the that you've been there done it and that's a very powerful uh, thing uh, that you're going to see out there. that's that's amazing yeah we will definitely do a session and uh, it it'll be great because a lot of people want to move back and forth uh, through the big four industry industry big four okay yeah. so we have this question and you know we'll take this last question which says uh, Uh, how do you see ai impacting junior consulting roles uh, besides bd roles so this is madhurika so, uh, so ai is going to impact you seen chat gpt right yes. it is it is going to completely destroy consulting the way we know it so if somebody can get an answer through chat gpt much better than you can give it so i can see uh, 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 and there could be many much more ai tools which are getting developed in fact uh, i can uh, the, the audit can be done through artificial intelligence machine learning so it will auditors become irrelevant after some time and i think we need to be ahead of the curve so while we say the human is irreplaceable but i think we need to be ahead of the curve and you need to do very much deep efforts and work see people don't realize we most of us skim the surface we don't go beyond the normal call of duty for me whenever i used to do a presentation to the client my one aim was i need to give them one or two things they have never heard before for that i have to work really hard and now with ai they will know everything i'm not sure i would succeed in this ai times so i'm not feeling uh, happy for the people who are there uh, and saying that you're going to get it but i think that uh, but artificial intelligence you'll have to work harder to be able to get it because you see for example when internet came in and google brought in all this the whole market research went away because all available right anybody could type it through google and get an answer so you had to give something much more than what google could give so now what chat gpt can give and chat gpt is also how you use it right it's everybody cannot use chat gpt the same way so we think it's available everybody get the same answer no so what do you do with that information how do you actually make some logical sense out of it and that's where the consultant can come in they can take all the information they've got put it into meaningful data and give it back to the client and that the client will not be able to do i'll give you a simple example when we were at arthur anderson we had developed something called the global best practices and we used to charge clients to log into this global best then one day somebody in chicago decided to give it free and you know what happened all clients got just there to give a uh, you know code which was free given to them they used to log in they used to go there they loved it they said okay how do we implement it came back to anderson anderson built a 3 billion dollar practice in one year on that global best practice so the point is uh, many times you have that knowledge you get excited about it and you could uh, then uh, move on to uh, 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 you know how do you make sense so i actually it's about working Uh, it's about staying ahead of the curve. You take your AI as a competition, and how do I stay ahead of it? And how do I be able to break much more meaningful? See, clients want solutions. Chat GPT will give up to a particular level, but they want answers to their problems, and that problem only you can solve. The consultant can solve. So I would say uh, uh, the younger consultants need to work even harder. then what they have they need to become much more aware they need to be much more informed and they need to be uh, i would say use your common sense in many cases i'll tell you many solutions are in common sense and how you able to see the one thing which i learned uh, when i used to hear steve jobs talk long back he said you always connect the dots later in your life so all what you learned in your young age as you were growing up you connect them much later and you can get the answer many times you don't get the answer from the problem you have but it could be in a very different situation can get an answer to a client 
it's about being able to put that i don't know whether i can explain it properly but some things come to you because um, uh, where you are able to find solutions for a problem which is not a normal solution where you take a lot of data a lot of information from very different industries different sectors and actually give the solution that's very well answered and it's a great question by madhurika as well so fair enough that's that's interesting so uh, so yes richard it's 1 hour 15 minutes and i know i told you hey we'll have a 45 minutes conversation but it was a great conversation so many learnings we've all learned so much genuinely and we have to do uh, another session on you know career transition because that will help a lot of people okay and also about ai that i mean your knowledge on ai AI. and esg i think these are and the ESG. three you know esg because these could be great career paths for people who are semi qualified and you could just go and do a certification on esg and you could become a champion there are no champions today please understand when uh, ifrs first came in it was not about training the board it was not about training the cfo but it's training the army of people of accountants who are there so esg people have to be trained and if you are trained uh, i think you can uh, you can have a great career in esg this is the future esg is going nowhere i mean it is going to stay forever you know simple line i'll give on esg esg makes you become a better human being simple talks of the environment it talks about the social it talks about governance it just helps you become a better human and i think this is not going to go anywhere so this is going to remain with us for a long time and i think the quicker we get on to this bandwagon for all those people looking for alternate careers please jump on to it and there are enough courses available on the internet some of them are free some of them may be paid but just do it and i think there is a shiv nagar university which is bringing a course out on it so you could look at various i mean there could be various things available so i may not have all the knowledge on it though i have personally learned i'm personally doing a lot of research on yes personally because it it really uh, i feel excited about it wow that's that's amazing so there is a lot of opportunities in the world that we are today we just have to okay. leverage it be optimistic be positive be a nice person and uh, always startup gentle uh, gentle the startup community is so big and there are so many opportunities there i would say i will say all the semi qualified please get into that startup community maybe start your own business also you don't need to be an accountant you could do a business which could be very different and people can make a lot of money so i would say there are various options available to you can use your accounting skills your auditing skills what you have learned you are no different from a chartered accountant let me tell you people are semi qualified please do not think of yourself anywhere any different i remember when i had uh, uh, when i had given my panel exam and i was with a client and i told him oh i got a chartered he said uh, there's no difference between you and a chartered in fact i find you better so it is not it's about uh, how you interact with the client what is the kind of knowledge you give him so i'll just leave it at that and uh, uh, when i was in ratan mama i was at that time i was giving my panel exams and there were chartered accountants who were reporting into me because i was made a group head and uh, so this fellow said why should i report to you you are junior you are you're not even a chartered accountant i said sure don't do it after 10 days of working on the same client he came to me and said from today i will report to you you are different from me and i will report to you so you have to earn the respect i would just say that to everybody so you don't need to look and say what's my qualification okay you may say it it's not same for everybody but maybe i was lucky so sure. well said so yes richard i mean we had this exciting amazing conversation i'm so thankful for your time and for everybody joining in and is going to watch it and read it later uh, so we we'll, so there's so much of insights packed we will email everyone the videos who not been able to attend it because it's it's a, it's an office working sure. day today uh, and uh, richard thank you again and uh, we'll meet soon thank sure. you so okay. much thank, thank you, you. So thank you and all the best all the thank best you. Thank thanks you. a lot bye see you thank you thank you Thank you.